Hello, Alex here, and in this video, we're going to talk about Mersh Photo Kenny's Alkaline ATS Rapid Fixer and what you need to know about it in terms of safety, handling, and disposal. This video is sponsored by the folks at thephotoshop.ie, who have partnered with me for this educational video and video series on photographic chemical safety. We'll talk more about them in a bit, but for now, let's get into it. Before we really get into it, I have to give my usual mandatory legal disclaimer. The opinions expressed within this video are my professional and educated opinions as someone who works in chemical waste disposal, but they are just opinions and do not constitute legal advice on behalf of myself or the folks at thephotoshop.ie. Nothing I say in this video can or will overrule or supersede your local laws. If you have general questions, feel free to leave a, a question in the comments down below, drop me an Instagram message or an email, but for more specific pressing matters, contact your local council, city, or other regulatory board. As we go through the video, we will give Mersh ATS Alkaline Rapid Fixer a ranking out of three for safety, handling, disposal, and of course, cost, and then tally the scores up at the end. Also, having done the full dev run in the playlist so far, this is the first time that we're doing a variant of a product that we've covered before. What I'm going to do is focus more on why you would use an alkaline fixer, and what that offers versus an acidic fixer in general, and then talk about the specifics as they pertain to this particular product. As we go through, a lot of these things are gonna to be topics that I've covered in the Ilford Rapid Fixer video, and I'm just gonna gloss over them where I have explained them in more detail previously. So why would you use an alkaline fixer instead of an acidic fixer? With the disclaimer that I've only had this bottle for a few months and I've only used it three times, I'm not an expert on alkaline versus acidic fixers. I've read a couple of books, checked dozens of forum posts and spoken to two people who know much more about these things than I do. And I've kind of put together a short list of some of the main benefits of using an alkaline fixer over an acidic fixer or situations where that would be preferable. Firstly, it's a lot easier to wash your prints and film to an archival level of quality. At high pH, the fibers in paper or the polymer gelatin itself in your film swells and becomes a bit more porous, so it's easier for water to get in and pull stuff out. It's the same basic idea between, behind an alkaline detergent that you would use for clothes, cotton, polyester, etc. It's exactly the same thing. The main benefit I've found for this, or that I've read, is for chlorobromide papers, like warm tone papers, and for lift printing. Secondly, and there is a bit of a debate about this, and it seems to depend specifically on the formulation of the type of film you use, but because the contents of the fibers in your paper or the stuff in your gelatin are a bit more accessible, it is said by some that you can fix things a little bit more quickly. Again, there's a bit of a debate about this. Some people say you can knock a minute off your fix time. Some people say it's only a few seconds, but there may be a difference there. Thirdly, when using a staining developer, like a pyro or tannol developer, the actual stain that you build up along with your silver is sensitive to acid and will be degraded, if not outright destroyed, if you use an acidic fixer. So it's considered broadly mandatory to use an alkaline fixer when working with these staining developers. Four, at low pH, under acidic conditions, the thiol sulfate ion, which is the active fixing ingredient in a fixer, is slowly degraded and broken down over time, destroying the fixer. This does not happen under alkaline conditions at high pH, so alkaline fixers have significantly longer shelf lives than their corresponding acidic fixer counterparts. And we'll see this in a bit. Five, under acidic conditions, the thiol sulfate ion does actually very slightly etch the edges of your silver crystals. And this is why it's possible to overfix things like microfilms, think CMS20. Under alkaline conditions, this is reduced to a completely negligible level. It's broadly accepted that you can't realistically overfix most films, but you could. And with an alkaline fixer, it's less of a concern. So if you're working with very slow films with very small grains, not even microfilms, think like Ilford Paneff, then it's less of a worry for that kind of thing if you aren't the kind of person who controls the timing of their fixing very well. Sixth and lastly, this varies widely by brand and formulation, but a lot of alkaline fixers are odorless formulations, which makes them a bit less stinky. If they're not completely odorless, they're a lot less stinky than the acidic counterparts, and they're just nicer to handle and a bit safer as a result. Ammonium thiosulfate at 60 to 70% is the active fixing agent that strips out unexposed, undeveloped silver plus ions from your emulsion. 
because this is a an ammonium thiosulfate and not sodium thiosulfate fixer, this is a modern rapid type fixer. And I used to think that only acidic fixers could be rapid fixers. Turns out that's not the case. Also, ammonium thiosulfate, that's where the ATS in the name comes from. Sodium sulfide at 2 to 8%, as I've mentioned before, is just an oxygen scavenger which helps to preserve the already ridiculous shelf life of this product even further. It preferentially reacts with oxygen in the headspace of the bottle, so the sodium sulfide is destroyed before the active thiosulfate gets destroyed. Somewhat unusually, the recommended dilutions are 1 plus 5 and 1 plus 10, meaning you prepare 6 or 11 litres of working solution versus 5 or 10 litres for a 1 plus 4, 1 plus 9 fixer, like most other fixers. Wolfgang says that this 1 litre is good enough for 50 to 60 rolls of film, and you could extend it a bit further if you extend your fixing times, but he doesn't recommend that because it might compromise the quality of your negatives. Something I saw online when I was doing research for this video is that a lot of retailers actually say you can fix 150 to 200 rolls of film with this stuff per litre. And I don't know if that's a really bad translation error or if someone made a mistake and everyone else is copying that from them, but Wolfgang's own website says 50 to 60 per litre. I'm not going to cover the actual method because I did talk about it previously, but yes, you can use alkaline fixers such as Mersh ATS Alkaline Rapid Fixer for two bath fixing to extend the life of your working solution without compromising on the archival quality of your negatives or your prints. If I don't say that, someone will ask. The shelf life of the one liter stock solution is 10 years unopened, which is absolutely bonkers. And even when you open it, it only drops down to eight years. The one plus five working solution has a shelf life of two to three years officially, probably a bit more than that realistically, and that's longer than an unopened, sealed bottle of Ilford Rapid Fixer. So that shows just how much of an effect the pH has on the long-term stability of your fixer. Section 2 notes that the fixer as a mixture overall is classified as non-hazardous, which makes sense because of both ammonium thiosulfate and sodium sulfide are non-hazardous, and even sulfides are used as food preservatives. Section 4, as usual, is pretty boilerplate. If you get it in your eyes, rinse them for 15 minutes with lots of water. If you get it on your skin, wipe it off and wash it off. If you or your child or anyone ingests it, seek medical attention immediately. Just because this stuff is classified as non-hazardous doesn't mean that there is no amount you could drink or get exposed to that would be harmful. It means that it's not considered hazardous in the intended exposure and usage amounts. Section 6 also says the usual that we've come to expect. Don't get it on your skin or in your eyes, and don't just go and pour the bottle down the drain if you don't want it anymore. Small spills can be dealt with by wiping them up and throwing the paper in the bin or, you know, wringing out a cloth into the drain, that kind of thing. But that's for unused fixer, not used fixer, as we'll come back to again later. Section 8 is also just about what you would expect. It says to work in a ventilated area to prevent the accumulation of noxious fumes. If you're working in your dark room for a day, the tiny amounts of whatever this does give off will probably accumulate to an annoying, if not potentially harmful level. Toxicologically, Section 11 tells us what we already knew, that the LD50 or the lethal dose 50% for this stuff is very, very high. Higher is better for an LD50 because it means it would take more of it to cause damage or harm to you. We already know that the contents of this stuff are not broadly considered hazardous and one of them is used in food. So yeah, high LD50 makes sense. It would take a lot to actually cause damage. The last two things I want to mention in terms of safety are firstly that it has a childproof safety cap, which means it's just safer. I mean, I, we get these with household cleaning products, but most darkroom chemicals don't have these caps. The logic being that you're storing them away from children, but you should also be storing household cleaning products away from children. Why not have these safety lock caps on everything? I think Wolfgang did a great job with that and it may, it's just common sense, I would have thought. And I don't see why the other ma manufacturers don't do that. The other thing is that this is an odorless formulation, which means I can crack this open, waft it, and I don't get anything, unlike with the Ilford Rapid Fixer. And this is not an empty bottle. There's, it's almost completely full. There's just no smell. I'm going to give Mersh ATS Alkaline Rapid Fixer a 2 out of 3 for safety. It's quite a bit nicer than Ilford's Rapid Fixer and it does show you, if you compare these two safety sections, the difference that that less than 2% acetic acid in the Ilford Acidic Fixer makes. It's still not completely harmless, 
but it is a bit nicer than the Ilford stuff, so two out of three seems fair. Section 7 of the SDS tells us that it's stored properly at normal temperatures, etc. There are no special precautions needed for its use. Section 10 tells us that it undergoes no dangerous reactions. And yes, it will eventually decompose on reaction with acid or when subjected to high heat, but not in the kind of caustic, bubbly, smoky reaction kind of way you'd see in a sci-fi movie. More of a, you need to let the firefighters know that you have a gallon of this stuff lying around if your dark room burns down kind of thing. For normal circumstances, there are no dangerous reactions to speak of. Aside from what's in the SDS, there are a few things that I want to talk about in terms of handling when it comes to this fixer. Firstly, it's a fixer and there's no real clear indicator as to when it becomes exhausted or when it is approaching exhaustion. You just need to learn or look up what an underfixed milky black and white negative looks like and be ready to make up a fresh batch when the time comes. Secondly, as the fixer approaches exhaustion, you may need to extend the time of your fixing process and the amount and when you need to do that is semi poorly defined. So you kind of have to err on the side of overfixing if you're unsure, which again, you know, it's less of a problem with an alkaline fixer than an acidic fixer, but it's just something you need to be mindful of and you can't just blindly fix everything for the same amount of time all the time. Thirdly, I already mentioned the safety benefits of it being an odorless formulation, but just practically handling wise, it's nicer to work with because of that. It's a lot easier to work with this, you know, out on the bench in your dark room than the Ilford Rapid Fixer with its acetic acid vinegary vapors. Fourthly, because this is an alkaline fixer and most developers work at alkaline pH, you cannot quench the developer by just pouring developer out and pouring fixer in like you would with an acidic fixer. It's bad for your fixer, but a lot of people do that. And that can mess with your negative density and it's not something you want to deal with. So you can't just go dev fix when using an alkaline fixer. Mersh ATS Alkaline Rapid Fixer has most of the same trappings and failings as Ilford's Rapid Fixer because it's still a fixer, but there are a few things that just make it a little bit nicer. The childproof safety cap, the odorless nature of it, these kind of things are small and I don't want to go and give it a two and a half and two and a half in safety and handling because I don't want to do that. But because the odorless nature of it is quite a big benefit in my personal opinion and experience, I won't go two and a half and two and a half, I'll go two and three. So it gets three out of three for handling. It's not 100% perfect, but it's the best I can do with my scoring system. And besides the safety cap and everything that kind of plays into both safety and handling, so whatever. Section 12 of the SDS shows that the actual concentrate itself as you receive it unused is of only minor ecological concern. Like I mentioned earlier, small spills and that kind of thing can easily be mopped up and either put in the bin or probably down the drain with a bit of water. Large amounts of the unused stuff I would be more wary of, but it's probably fine. Maybe do it over the course of a day or two if you do need to dispose of a bottle of this stuff. Don't just pour the whole thing down the drain in one go and leave it, you know. Small portions with lots of warm water kind of pushing it down the drain. Section 13 is where it gets good though, that's where all the good stuff is, and I'm just gonna briefly go over the points from the previous video again. Firstly, used fixer, which contains silver thiosulfate, is heavy metal waste and should not just be poured down the drain because it ranges from ill-advised to quite highly illegal depending on where you are in the world. Of note, the SDS here actually does say not to dispose of used fixer down the drain without desilvering it yourself. And Wolfgang deserves a small amount of praise for that because that is well beyond the legal minimum requirements of preparing an SES by actually including this advice where most manufacturers don't bother. Secondly, the silver waste, aside from just being, you know, civilly or legally a bad idea, will corrode metal drain pipes. So it could cause problems with your plumbing if you're doing this a lot over a period of years. So just don't. Thirdly, you can accumulate your silver waste over time and potentially leave it to evaporate in a safe, secure way away from children, etc., to kind of concentrate it, remove some of the water, and then either desilver it yourself by one of the various means that you can look up online, or bring it to a recycling or disposal facility in your county or whatever. There are a few around most places. Uh, and either pay or for a few days a year, have it taken away for free. 
Unfortunately, I have to give Mersh's ATS Alkaline Rapid Fixer a zero out of three for disposal because all of the various benefits of alkaline fixers, the safety cap, the odorless nature, have nothing to do with the actual silver thiosulfate, which is the problematic component when it comes to disposing of fixer. In this regard, it's exactly the same as Ilford Rapid Fixer and almost any other fixer you could possibly concoct or buy. So yeah, it makes sense to rank it on par with the Ilford Rapid Fixer, which is to say, they're both a pain in the ass to deal with when it comes to disposal. Although the rated capacity of this fixer is only about half of what it is with Ilford Rapid Fixer per litre of stock solution, the stock concentrate, it doesn't really matter for most people, I would say. The vast majority of people I know are not doing two bath fixing and using their fixer to the absolute last to get as many rolls as possible. I do know people who do that, but most don't. So I don't know where the exact point would be, but there is a point at which this is slightly cheaper than Ilford Rapid Fixer, then they are equal. And then if you are using your fixer to its maximum capacity, then the Ilford Rapid Fixer is much, much cheaper, about slightly over half the cost long-term. Like I said before though, the main cost associated with fixer is not the cost of the fixer itself, it's the cost associated with disposal if you aren't able to desilver it yourself or take advantage of a free disposal day in your area. So for that reason, two out of three for cost. Before I tally up the scores, I do of course need to give a massive shout out and thanks to the folks at thephotoshop.ie for partnering with me for this educational video and video series on photographic chemical safety. They are an absolute pleasure to deal with as always and by far my favorite retailer in this country. Sorry, John. Their catalog is always growing and they're very receptive to taking on things and stocking things that the actual market here wants and the fact that they listen to people and ask and meet our needs rather than just stocking whatever's convenient means so much to me and so many other people. Even if you aren't based in Ireland, they're so highly competitive on so many products that it might still be cheaper even with the cost of shipping from Ireland than buying from your retro camera, your photo impex and those other big EU retailers. I'm still very new to darkroom printing, but Brendan of the Photoshop is not, and he recently updated and publicized his print toning guide, and there is so much information in there that you should definitely give it a look, and if you have any questions, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them. Thanks again to the folks at thephotoshop.ie, and now let's tally up the scores. For safety, Mersh ATS Alkaline Rapid Fixer gets a 2 out of 3. For handling, 3 out of 3. For disposal, 0 out of 3. And for cost, 2 out of 3 for a total score of seven out of 12. So the scores really don't differ too much from Ilford Rapid Fixer because the differences between them are very slight. Yes, as I said, there are differences, are different situations where it's beneficial to use an alkaline fixer or where it's basically, if not absolutely required to use one. But fixer is still fixer. You know, it's different flavors of the same thing. Chocolate ice cream and strawberry ice cream are still both ice cream. They have the same general idea of what you would use them for. Alkaline and neutral fixers do definitely have a place in a modern darkroom, and I will be keeping this bottle in mind for years to come, not to replace Ilford Rapid Fixer, but as a complement to it to be used where it suits. That's all I have to say for this video. Stay safe, and bye-bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at chaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.